Hello, my name is Louis Donal, and I'm the admissions manager for the Department of Physical Therapy. Uh, I'll be kicking off this Indigenous Pathway info session recording for you today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling from my home on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. So now we'll move on to the next slide. Next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Field. I am a Métis, Cree, and Swedish on my mom's side and Irish and English on my dad's side. Uh, and I work here at uh, the UBC Vancouver campus, which is located on the Hunkamanian speaking Musqueam peoples. Um, and I work as the Indigenous Initiatives Manager. My name is Amy Ellis, and my pronouns are she, her. I am of English, Scottish, and Irish descent. I'm a recent immigrant and settler here in Canada, and I was born on the lands of the Situ and Swana people in South Africa. I love work and raise my family on the unceded ter shared territories of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Kukwetlem, Semiamu, and Tawasan and Stolo First Nations. Part of my work will be is collaborating with communities in the Fraser region as I am the clinical site lead for the Fraser Valley cohort, and we will explain a little bit more about what that means. Physical therapists are primary care professionals. So what does primary care, primary care professional means that we are able to um, see patients without a referral from a doctor. Uh, patients can come and see us directly or part of as a referral. We can work either independently in a clinic or as part of a collaborative healthcare team in a wide variety of settings. So you might see us working in orthopedics, which is working with bones and joints that can be in a hospital. For example, somebody getting a joint replacement. Uh, we help them post pre and post operative uh, with their recovery. Um, and that spectrum of care extends to helping them recover from surgery, even in the community and sometimes in their home. Pediatrics is looking after children, and we work for uh, all the, the conditions that we cover in adults. Uh, we cover in children as well, and that would be under pediatrics. Cardiorespiratory physiotherapy is my personal interest, and that's where we look at the lungs and heart um, as the focus of our care. So I work with helping people that are uh, weak from critical illness. Uh, they've been in hospital. They've been very sick. Uh, we help with getting mucus out of lungs so that they can breathe better. Um, and also maybe people that have had heart problems or uh, people that have had other specific lung problems as well. Rheumatology is people with arthritis, uh, so they would help to uh, support care for those patients, help to reduce pain, um, exercises for strengthening, and protecting those joints. Gerontology is helping elder people um, and it's a special focus on quality of life and strength and um, function in the, the old age. Pelvic health is a term that refers to what used to previously be known as women's health. So it does include um, incontinence of women um, and issues associated with um, giving birth, but this more a uh, broad term now includes um, also working with people with prostate issues, um, other causes of uh, pelvic health, and also um, surgeries and interventions related to gender affirming care. Sports physical therapy is looking at sports people, helping them to perform their best and recover from injuries. Manual therapy is looking at um, using your physical hands to help move joints to improve function and reduce pain. We also work with people that have neuro, we broadly call the neurosciences, that would be people that have neurological issues, such as um, a stroke or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. We also work with people uh, under the bracket of 
oncology. So that would be people with a variety of cancer diagnoses um, and helping to support them in their recovery um, through chemo or radiation or surgery or whatever treatment uh, is being used. We do also work in the realm of health promotion. We don't just want to get involved when there is a problem. We want to help reduce the, the chances of there being a problem. So an example of that with public health, it's education about exercise and movement and strengthening uh, the pelvic floor during pregnancy. The other piece that's really important is we don't just exist in the healthcare system. We can also work to help improve the healthcare system, so healthcare management, looking at how systems work um, and sort of management and higher level um, positions within healthcare as well can be filled by physical therapists. So there is a very broad um, scope of practice um, and many different environments that you can work in. And the one piece that I enjoy about that is through your career, as you have different interests or different life um, situations, you can move uh, into different areas of practice um, and experience a broad range. You don't have to stay in one um, area for the entirety of your career. The goals of physical therapy are to improve and maintain physical mobility and independence. We also want to prevent, manage, and reduce pain and physical limitations or disabilities that may limit activities and participation, and also improving overall fitness, health, and well-being. And all of that works together to help improve people's ability, uh, their quality of life, um, and the ability to participate in their community. So how do you become a physical therapist here in BC? So the first step is to complete a graduate uh, bachelor's program uh, in a university. It can be any bachelor's program. There isn't a specific requirement. We've had um, applicants from a wide variety of um, backgrounds, such as teaching and music and dance, as well as kinesiology. But what is important is that you still have to complete the prerequisite courses. So if you do a degree that doesn't include the prerequisites, you need to look into them and see how you can add them into your coursework or meet those requirements before uh, joining or applying for the program. The MP you would then apply to the MPT program and complete it, uh, which is a 26 month program with five clinical placements. And I'll chat a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides. And then you need to pass uh, what, what has previously been called the PCE exam with both written and clinical components. And that is a national exam. Uh, since COVID, there have been some changes. And right now the written is being done as a national exam and the clinical is being done uh, in each province. So at the moment we're doing an exam called the ACEBC, but there are some changes coming up with that in the future. And there is a plan to work towards uh, the examination process remaining national. And this helps to allow and support physical therapists being able to register with different uh, providen provinces um, and maintaining the standard of care across the country. So an uh, overview of the program, it is a two year, 26 month full-time professional master's degree. So that means you're full-time uh, either in the class or on clinical placements. You will have over a thousand hours of clinical experience in these five clinical placements. The idea between, so what will happen is they move between uh, lecture, which we call acad and lab, which is academic, and clinical experiences through the program um, to help build your experience. So you learn the basics and foundations, you get a chance to apply it, and then you bring that back to the classroom over the course of the, the program. The one thing that I would like to highlight here is that Indigenous students do have an opportunity to highlight um, if there are any specific um, requirements that they have to help meet their um, 
clinical requirements and also if there are any specific uh, placements that they find would meet their needs. So there would be more information shared about that at the time, but just to highlight, we do um, have a process for Indigenous students to share um, requests around um, their learning experiences in the clinical environment. This is the UBC program is one of only 15 MPT programs in Canada. It is the only entry to practice physical therapy program in BC, and we are accredited by the Physiotherapy Education, Education Accreditation Canada. So the way that the program um, is designed is as um, an integrated curriculum that progresses across both the lifespan. So as I mentioned, from kids, from babies, all the way into geriatrics, so elders. And it's also across the continuum of care. So what I mean by that is um, patients don't just access, people don't just access the healthcare system at certain discrete points. They may sometimes, but we also, we also see that, for example, if somebody has an accident and they're injured, they come to the hospital, they might need that high level of hospital care, and then they would go back into their home, uh, which we would say is community-based care. They either might need help that comes into their home, home-based care, or they may need to um, come into an outpatient clinic. Um, and then we also look at community reintegration. So the continuum of care describes the different places in, in situations in which health care is given. And over the course of the 26 months, you will see that there's a progression from foundational information to entry to practice. And through this integrated approach, it's not that you have to learn um, all the basic sciences and then all the MSK, neurological and cardiopulmonary. We're integrating that with um, ethical decision-making, professionalism, critical thinking, and communication across the entirety of the course. Um, they still build on each other, uh, but you're um, learning through all of these domains uh, continuously throughout the program. The slide shows just the breakdown of how the 26 months uh, would look. Uh, the pattern over the the program is the same for each group. Uh, this is the program plan for the 23-25 class. What you will see here is that in the initial period, it's very heavy on the academics. So you spend more time in classrooms and labs learning that foundational information before you head out on your clinical experiences, clinical education, which is these green blocks that you can see on this um, plan. And this is important so that by the time you go out on your first placement, you have that uh, good foundation of general, of information across the, the principal areas of practice, uh, and you're able to go on placement and practice those skills. As you progress through the program, the shift is towards clinical education. And you'll see in the second year, there is more time spent on placement than in the classroom. But that's part of the progression of, the, of what you know um, and having chances to apply it um, in the clinical setting. Um, the other thing to highlight is the five placements are a mix of five and six week placements. So that's different to how it has previously been running, but this is how it will continue in the future. And that's because uh, when we did a review of the five week placement, we found that there was additional benefit to having an additional week on placement um, to enhance your learning in the clinical environment. We also have uh, something called the MPT PhD dual degree program. It's designed for candidates who are interested in integrating clinical and research learning. This program is currently going, undergoing revisions, so please be sure to indicate if you intend to apply on your online application, um, and we will make sure that you get updates on what the new um, 
process and program is looking like. The MPT program is a distributed program, and this means that our 140 students that we intake each year are divided across four different sites across BC. The current sites that we have at the moment is the Vancouver site that has 80 students. We then have the Prince George um, site with 20 students per year. The Fraser site has 20 students per year as well, and that's the site that I am based at. And our brand new cohort that started this year is in Victoria with an additional 20 students. This means that the curriculum, so what does distribution mean? The curriculum is de delivered to geographically distinct sites over video conference. So no matter which site you're at, everyone gets the same information. But what changes is which site the information is being taught from. So when I teach, I teach from Fraser. All the other sites are watching from either their lab space or their lecture space um, and learning from their site. But we take turns. So there are faculty at all of the sites. So each uh, distributed site gets an opportunity to have the, the instructor in class and uh, receive the information from another site. When we have labs and tutorials, we do get what we call CSAs, so clinical skills assistants. So that's physical therapists from the local community that come in and help in, with the in-class cl in learning. So what this means is that although the overall course delivery may be coming from another site, you still have someone to practice your, your skills with um, and for them to be able to see and give you feedback um, and help to enhance your learning uh, in person, on site, at your, um, your in the site that you're located at. We do also use synchronous and asynchronous online education platforms. So certain courses and certain parts of courses where we found it beneficial, we do then, we can run it either or on Zoom where everyone's online or asynchronously like this one, uh, where you can watch the recording and then have an opportunity to meet and discuss the content that was covered. This format allows us allows our students to be educated by expertise from across the province. It allows my knowledge of critical care and acute care uh, being shared across all of the sites and in other communities that may not have um, facilities that allow them to use the skills um, and knowledge that I that I have, um, and each site has faculty with their own um, focus of the area of interest that they teach about. It also allows us to learn about perspectives from different areas of the province. This is a robust and proven model of health profession education, um, and it is working well for us at the moment. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Shannon. So as Amy mentioned, the Vancouver campus is the largest campus with 80 students. Um, all of the MPT students are considered UBC students, so everyone has access to all UBC resources. But of course, the students in Vancouver are going to have the easiest access to some of those resources. Um, specifically thinking of like the physical resources, like going to the Longhouse, um, like going to the Shata Taklam Collegium, um, which is the Indigenous Student Collegium, uh, the Indian Residential School and History and Dialogue Center. So all of those places all offer different cultural activities, social activities, wellness drop-ins, including counseling services uh, for Indigenous students. Um, and then in addition to that, UBC Vancouver, for those folks that are interested in living on campus uh, and or bringing uh, their children with them to campus, um, Indigenous Peoples of Canada are given priority access to housing and childcare. So often people are put on really, really long wait lists for those. Um, Indigenous Peoples are going to get uh, priority access uh, as long as you submit by the date, which is sometime usually in the spring, I think it's about May, but definitely check out the website when you uh, put in your application for the MPT program. 
In the north, which is our, um, our first distributed site, uh, we're paired up with the University of Northern British Columbia up in Prince George. Um, so the whole goal of that cohort was really about getting recruitment and retention of physical therapists in the northern and rural areas, um, which has a significant shortage of PT. So the benefit of um, being in the north is you do have a much smaller cohort, so you really get to bond with um, your peers and your faculty members, the clinical um, skills assistants and so forth. Um, people really enjoy their experience. Um, and as a UNBC, you get like a dual student um, role, you do get to access some of the UNBC resources. So you can head over to their First Nation Center and their gathering place as well. For Fraser Valley, um, this is located, so the one thing is it's not really located on um, a usual campus, so it doesn't have all of the physical resources that um, the other sites have that are in partnership at a university campus, um, but you still get the really small uh, cohort experience, so those nice close bonds, um, and you do get to live in the Surrey Fraser Valley region, which is a uh, pro for a lot of people. And then just like the North is, has a lot of its mm -hmm. clinical focus in the Northern region, the Fraser also has focus within the Fraser health region. And that would be the same for our fourth site, which is in Victoria. Um, so Victoria is in partnership with UVic though. So just like the other universities, you do have access to things like the First People's House and other student uh, Indigenous Student Support Services at UVic. Again, 20 students, so nice close-knit cohort, um, and just a different experience over on the island. Um, before I move on, I just wanted to check, Amy, is there anything I missed about the sites that you want to share? No, I think you, you covered it quite well. Um, I think the only lens is, is that you will go from a clinical placement perspective, you will go on placement in the region that you, of the cohort that you're in, when we look at the the smaller sites, such as the North, uh, the Fraser Valley and Vancouver Island. So there's a requirement to do a certain number of placements in those communities um, and they have geographical uh, boundaries. But when we look at the Vancouver cohort, they have um, a, a mandate to have their clinical education across the province so they can have placements in any area. And there's actually a requirement to have a certain number of placements outside of the lower main uh, land. Um, we use Metro Vancouver as the geographical boundary. Um, so it's important to see the Vancouver cohort not as um, students geographically bound to Vancouver, but rather a cohort of students that represent um, and, and work and go on placement throughout the, the region, whereas the smaller groups are more geographically bounded. But that's not to say that they can't go on placement anywhere. You can, anyone can have a placement in any region. Uh, just the smaller sites have a requirement to do a minimum number of placements within their region. Thank you. Um, also acknowledging that the sites are distributed and sometimes it feels like there's separation. So we do put some effort into connecting students across the sites. Uh, the MPT Indigenous students have formed a collective. Um, and then as well, we've been making partnerships with the different programs across the Faculty of Medicine to bring Indigenous students together. Um, and both of those groups will host various gatherings throughout the year, both virtually and in person. Um, we also have a MPT Indigenous Student Canvas page. So that's where I put all of the different resources, um, events, wellness resources, things about clinical placements, like whatever you need to know, um, I try to include it on there. There is a discussion forum um, that exists on there. It's not super well used. I know a lot of the students also create their own social pages, which they use to communicate with each other. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the Shata Tequam Collegium also hosts lots of virtual events to connect students, as well as SAGE, which 
is often kind of a little bit more research focused for graduate students, but I think lots of valuable um, information comes there, lots of Indigenous faculty that you get to network with as well. Um, so there's lots of ways to still stay connected across the sites. And then just making mention to some of the other resources that you have as a UBC student. Again, it doesn't matter which site you're at, all of the students can access UBC resources. Um, most of the resource teams at UBC do have Indigenous staff on them and they've made Indigenous um, either teams or um, partnered with other teams so that they, you know, it's not just one person, but um, there's some more partnerships and really creating lots of uh, supportive Indigenous initiatives. One of those is the uh, Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Team um, with UBC Counseling. So currently they have two Indigenous counselors that you can access, um, but the MPT program also has an embedded counselor. So the purpose of an embedded counselor is just somebody who kind of understands the intricacies and stressors that are program specific. Um, so that's somebody else that you can speak to. And all UBC Counseling can be accessed both in person and virtually. Enrollment services is another really great resource. They offer um, financial planning and emergency funding in addition to um, being able to talk about fees and tuition and things like that. Um, and they have an Indigenous team there as well. So does the Center for Accessibility and so does the UBC Equity and Inclusion Office, um, as well as the Faculty of Medicine has its own um, Equity Inclusion Office, so it's just a slightly different name. Um, so lots of different resources if you ever need to reach out to somebody, um, if you're having challenges in various places, um, if you don't know where to start, um, we all network together and so we're always able to share um, who is the best person um, and also, you know, making sure that we follow up with students because the goal is not to have anyone just kind of like fall through the cracks, if you will. Um, as I mentioned, again, it's a it's a really close knit group. So even if you're not accessing any sort of external resources, you you have a lot of peers who have shared experiences and a lot of the folks share um, just how much they've established these lifelong um, networks, both of professionally, but also of friends, right? They have lasting friends um, for years and years. I, I know some of our alumni and, you know, they they went to each other's weddings and just stayed close for a really long time. Um, and the uh, we also have a physical therapy student society. So in addition to the MPT Indigenous Student Collective, um, there's the broader student society, and they also organize all sorts of socials and study groups and different activities on and off campus. So lots of opportunities for our students. Um, there's different continuing education um, in all sorts of different practice areas, whatever you're interested in. You can also participate in research uh, or be involved in health policy, uh, work abroad, um, lots of flexible work hours and areas, I would say. Um, and the province is really in need of physical therapists, which is why we have so many distributed sites. We've been expanding the last few years because of this need. So I think that's all for me. I'll pass it on to Louis. Thanks. Uh, so I will move on to some admission requirements information. Uh, great. So the minimum requirements for the program uh, are that you need a four-year bachelor's degree in any field. So if you're coming from creative writing or engineering or kinesiology, all those degrees are weighed the same in the application process. You'll need 76% in all your senior level courses. Uh, that's a faculty of graduate and postdoctoral studies requirement, and it's um, applicable to any graduate program basically at UBC. You also need 72% in each of your prerequisite courses and 70, 70 hours of volunteer experience. That volunteer experience and or 
uh, work experience needs to be with people that have uh, either cognitive, emotional, or physical disabilities. Uh, you may also have heard of the CASPER test that we require for admission. Um, what the CASPER test is in a nutshell, it's a uh, situational judgment test. So it will uh, put you in uh, various, you know, professional or social context situations. And basically, it will ask you how you would react to those situations. Um, it is uh, both done through uh, video recording and typed answers. Uh, and if you have any questions about the Casper test, I highly uh, recommend that you go on their website because it is a third party tool that's not associated with UBC. So um, they do have a lot of resources that they update um, every year, basically. So I highly encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, it's also important for you to provide two academic references and one practical reference. Your practical reference will need to be from the same person uh, that supervised you during your volunteer experience. If you're using two volunteer experiences to combine the hours, then it should ideally be from the experience where you have the most hours in. So we have an indigenous pathway for admission and um, essentially 6% of, uh, of our seats uh, are reserved for indigenous students. That means eight seats for uh, the next admission cycle. Um, what uh, you need to do to qualify for those seats is meet the minimum requirements that I just mentioned above. Uh, and you also have to provide um, documentation of indigenous ancestry. If you're not sure uh, which documents to provide or if your you know, documents are, are appropriate, uh, you can always email Shannon. Uh, her email is right here on the screen, shannon.feel at ubc.ca, and she can help you out with that. So, um, you know, after you apply, uh, if you're selected for in, an interview, our interview process is the MMI, so multi-mini interviews. It's essentially a set of 10 stations. You'll spend two minutes um, reading a scenario and then six minutes answering with an interviewer in the same um, Zoom call because we do this virtually now. Um, and you also have one break. So it's actually nine uh, questions that you'll have to answer. And the whole thing takes about an hour and a half. So what is it for? It's meant to ascertain uh, non-academic skills and you know your overall suitability for the program. So verbal communication, professionalism, problem solving, you know, ethical uh, thinking, problems, um, sorry, um, collaboration, um, you know, all those things are uh, sort of skill, non-academic skills that are uh, part of the interview process. Um, for Indigenous applicants, we provide a workshop. Um, so this is usually in February, uh, and it's meant to introduce you to the MMI format. So what I just mentioned of going through these stations, uh, it can be quite intimidating the first time that you experience going through quick interviews in that format. So we're, this sort of workshop is meant to um, help you get used to that. And it's also an opportunity to connect with Indigenous students, staff, and faculty. So important dates, um, applications are open right now. They opened uh, on October 1st and they will close on January 5th. You'll have an additional 10 days to submit all your documents. And then the interviews are going to be on the first week of March. Uh, we should be posting the exact date on our website fairly soon. I would say by the end of the next week, probably. Uh, so mid-October. Um, I will note just that, uh, so important things to know, when you submit your application uh, before January 5, that's all the online uh, information that is required. So all your academic history, um, you know, contact information for your references. Um, and there's also a set of additional questions um, for the program, uh, like, uh, you know, your site references, which sites you'd like to uh, apply for things like that. So you submit that. And once you submit that, the UBC online system will send um, requests 
to your references. So that's important to note um, because, you know, January is a busy time. Uh, so if you want to make sure that your, you know, referees get those uh, notifications early, uh, you will have to submit your application a little bit earlier. Um, and we also generally just recommend getting in touch with your referees ahead of time so they know that this is coming. It will help them prepare uh, and, and make the process easier uh, for them. So what's due on January 15? So that's everything else. Uh, so your supplemental application where you list all your prerequisites and there's like a you know, 200 word essay uh, and you can also uh, sort of list any complimentary experience on there. So there's a whole form available on our website that is due by January 15. So are your references, uh, the Casper test, uh, you know, basically uh, everything else, um, IDs or, you know, any additional documentation uh, will be uh, required by that date. Oops, I think I skipped one. Oh, so uh, for the financial support opportunities, I will uh, hand it over back to Shannon. Thanks, Louis. Um, I just wanted to bring this up after the admissions info, um, because a lot of the awards and scholarships are due in around April. Um, so it's before you usually like know whether you've been accepted into the program, but after you've applied, um, just apply. Apply anyways. Um, all, any award funding body will check in with you when it's um, time to actually hand over the funds to just make sure that you've actually been in the program. Um, so do look out for those uh, award dates. We usually try to send out a list of various awards. It's not all inclusive. So always make sure that um, you're also kind of doing your own research and looking out for funding. Um, but apply, apply early for sure. The other resource I mentioned already was enrollment services. And so they offer financial wellness workshops. They also do lots of one-on-one -on -one advising about loans and scholarships and tuition payments and all of um, those great things. Um, and if you're ever in a situation where you require some emergency funding, you can also access it from them. Um, so apply for awards. You can also look for a sponsorship from um, your band or if you're a part of a Métis or Inuit organization, sometimes they have funding for their students. And as of right now, the uh, government is also trying to recruit um, more healthcare providers and so encouraging students by offering them funding. So right now they're offering uh, $5,000 to Indigenous health students um, until 2025. So that's another opportunity there. That's everything. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is the last slide. If you have any questions, just send us an email and we'll make sure that we we answer. We're usually pretty quick. Uh, it takes about a couple of business days at the most uh, and then we you know, answer your questions. So thanks for watching and we hope that you apply.